Hi everyone, this is Jay from Interview Query. Uh, today I am uh, joined with uh, Shashank. I think I said that right, even though I yeah. keep on forgetting. <laughs> um, who has worked in data for uh, a couple of years now. Uh, previously worked at companies uh, such as Salt Startups and Amazon. Um, welcome to uh, the mock interview. Uh, and before we get started, I would love to uh, just kind of like ask you about your background and how you got into data science uh and mm -hmm. yeah how you got interested in it sure um uh, thank you so much for having me over here jay um so a little bit about my background um i've always been a data and um numbers guy um i used to work as a bi engineer back before i got my masters and then i did a masters in data analytics um worked as a data scientist for almost two years um, mostly my experience has been around machine learning uh, problems and machine learning implementation. Um, ended up learning some DevOps skills as well and like PySpark stuff so that uh, when, you know, when you have the products need to be scaled out, um, the coding is pretty different. Um, so I ended up learning uh, how to convert like Python code to PySpark on my own, uh, but that was a great learning experience. Um, and then I moved over to Amazon as a business intelligence engineer. Uh, most of my work over here was around, um, you know, Tableau reporting, building ETL jobs, um, you know, figuring out uh, what kind of data s structure needs to be in the reporting databases so that your uh, end reports work well and, you know, just digging into deeper into different metrics that the business wants to learn and just providing more information on what they could look at instead of what they're already looking at. Um, so that's pretty much what my uh, experience has been so far. Um, from a technical point of view, it's more about uh, SQL, Python, PySpark, Tableau, um, and then uh, some Django uh, web API as well. Uh, because in my previous company, uh, nobody really knew how to use you know Python-based data science models. So yeah. I had to figure out how to uh, productionalize them on my own and have the end product just make like web API calls to get their predictions instead of them trying to, um, you know, uh, ingest a model and then interact with it. So that was uh, a pretty neat skill to have. I think that's something that's being needed more and more in many companies these days. Definitely, yeah. And I think uh, the overall kind of scale of data sciences um, needs a lot of what you just kind of described in different kinds of, um, metrics to track, like ETL jobs, um, being able to do the modeling for each and just having an idea of uh, every part of the funnel uh, in terms of yeah, data yeah. And analytics. Cool. So uh, I'd love to start out with like a first question. Um, and let's mm -hmm. say um, this has to deal with uh, an e-commerce website like Amazon, right? So let's say you're running an e-commerce website uh, and you want to get rid of, uh, let's say duplicate products that may be listed under different sellers names uh, in a, like a really large database. Uh, so mm -hmm. for example, um, we have two products, but they're the same product, uh, but they're named iPhone X and Apple iPhone 10, right? Uh, and mm -hmm. so given that we have uh, these two products, we want to deduplicate it. But let's say that this example shows up for like a lot of different cases. Um, what's mm -hmm. one way that you would go, a bit, go about actually doing this? Got it. Um, so if it's a established, uh, e-commerce uh, company, I would assume that they would have, uh, some kind of an ID, uh, for every product that they have in their inventory. So something like an SKU or an ASIN, if it's Amazon, then, uh, that's pretty unique. And, um, you know, even the, even if the description is different in different, under different sellers, I, I would assume that they would have the same, uh, SKU. So. You know, if you just look at the, you know, get a list of all the, all like get a total of the SKUs under different sellers and then uh, do a distinct list of SKUs across sellers, you will notice what kind of um, SKUs are replicated and under which seller. And then once you have that, um, you can go to the business saying, what do you want to do with them? De de delete them, merge them or whatever be the case. Gotcha. Um, okay. Yeah. Cool. So let's say, um, let's make it a little bit more complicated and let's say that we don't have the SKU, right? Um, and let's mm -hmm. say that people are just uh, creating their listings by just entering in like what they think the product names are and then, uh, you know, like a picture, description, um, mm -hmm. and essentially what kind of goes on on Amazon right now, right? Um, so uh, how would we do the, I guess, the mapping to the SKUs or would you even think of like a different 
approach towards um, even like solving that problem? Um, yeah, I mean, a couple of things come to mind. Um, if we have um, uh, what do you call like images for uh, for these products that we think may be duplicated, um, we can try to you know use some algorithms that uh, identify similar images. And then uh, once you have that list of similar images, then you look at the descriptions, and then you can build a string similarity kind of a algorithm, which you know says which, which descriptions sound very similar or are very close to each other. And then um, you would have two, at least two data points that say that, you know, these two products seem to be similar. And then it's probably going to be a little bit of manual intervention to identify, are they really similar or not? Um, but um, going by image similarity and you know, description similarity, that should be pretty good in itself. Um, the other thing that I can think of is um, maybe reviews on different products. Um, so imagine that uh, there are two different products just named differently, but both of them are like an Apple iPhone 10. Um, you would assume that the reviews are pretty much talking about a phone and it's manufactured by Apple and probably have the same kind of experiences. So you could try to see if the reviews are very similar to each other. And that, that gives a good indication that the product is probably the same. Gotcha. Okay. So let's say we go with the process of um, all those things, right? And we're looking at similarity mm -hmm. across images, across mm -hmm. descriptions, across reviews, right? Um, and so we're getting this like score for each one of them, right? Mm -hmm. um, so now how do we go about uh, and figure out if we can duplicate them, deduplicate them or not? Um, do we have like a human review every single one? Do we do some sort of like scaling process? Because let's say we have to do this for like thousands and thousands of products, right? Right, right. Uh, what's kind of the, ne the next step? Um, so, uh, because we, like, from the beginning, we don't really know which products are uh, the same or not. Uh, so, it, we can't really do, like, a supervised learning here. Uh, it needs to be an unsupervised technique that first tries to identify um, what what stuff are similar to each other. So, um, I'd probably do, like, a clustering um, based on just descriptions, you know. Like, first, we'll definitely do some cleaning and, you know, tokenization and stuff for the uh, text data and then bring it to a st structured format and then uh, try to cluster, try to maybe do like a TF-IDF on different documents. Um, and these documents would have the description and maybe reviews as well. So you do a TF-IDF to find out which documents are similar to each other. You'll get some scores. Um, and then uh, you can, uh, depending on how many documents end up in a particular cluster, um, you will definitely have to do a manual step to see if they're actually same or not. Um, images as well, I think, um, um, I'm not aware of a clustering technique that works on images, but um, you will probably have to build out features from the image, uh, bring it to a structured format, and then do clustering on top. Um, so you might be able to identify like 10 different clusters if there are 10 different, if there are 10 items that are duplicated, and then look at the cluster's descriptive statistics to see what what is this cluster really talking about? Is it a phone? Is it a tablet? Is it a computer or whatever? And then try to and then go about you know manual investigation from that point of view from that point. Okay, so let's say we do that and uh, we're going through these clusters, right? Um, and then we find that uh, the algorithm has at least for a couple of them has clustered just like phones together instead of being mm -hmm. specific enough for um, the same product, right? Mm -hmm. um, or maybe um, we're getting like thousands of different clusters um, potentially where like uh, they're maybe not, like, not matched up as well. Is there any way that we can almost like optimize our uh, manual uh, intervention or like any other techniques in which we can kind of scale this problem out so that uh, we somehow use like the least amount of, you know, manual overview while also uh, figuring out like a way to uh, do it efficiently as well. Right. Um... I guess it uh, it would uh, depend on the features that we actually extract. Uh, the more granular the features in our data set, uh, the better uh, yeah, the clusters could be. Um, yeah. if, if we are uh, creating clusters just on the type of device, then you're right. I think uh, all phones and all computers will just end up uh, together. 
but if we, um, given that these are also like, you know, uh, we suspect that these are duplicate listings, um, we would definitely want to look at more information of the listing itself, like what is the price of the product, what's the, um, maybe the different types of colors that's available, um, and then what is the, I don't know what, uh, like, you know, stuff that uh, iPhones and Androids have uh, similar to each other, like, you know, what's the operating system and stuff like that. So depending, uh, so the features need to be as close to the product uh, itself so that um, our clusters are more um, identifiable among each other and not generic as you know, phones and computers. Um, so that's what comes to mind. Um, but other than that, um, let me think about if there's anything else that could be useful here um so we have a listing maybe there are sellers as well right like uh, different sellers i mean you could assume that a particular a seller of um you know uh, different phones are similar to each other in their characteristics like you know yeah. it's a electronic seller and uh, they have so uh, so and so different products and this is the amount of um, average revenue that they get and stuff like that so depending on the seller's uh, demographics, I think uh, we'd be able to identify what seller is probably an electronics seller versus a hardware seller. Um, okay. So that could be something useful to look at. Um, and then maybe the customers itself uh, or like, you know, we can look at purchase behavior as well. Um, iPhones typically tend to uh, sell out as soon as they're launched. So you can try to, you know, use information around when a particular product was launched and then look at the purchase pattern during that time and then try to integrate these features uh, in your actual data set so that there's some uh, customer purchase behavior being you know, being looked at, some seller behavior being looked at, and, and most of it would be the product description itself, like the product uh, features itself. Okay. And then I wanted to do a brief feedback session on the first question too. So what did you think about the first question? Yeah, uh, I think the question was good. Um, it was uh, pretty vague in the beginning, uh, but I think uh, based on what your uh, cues were, um, I, I, I felt like a, it, a, we wanted a more, uh, no algorithmic solution than like a SQL database kind of a solution. So yeah. initially I thought that it's more like a SQL question where I can tell what kind of distincts or which columns I need to be grouping by. Mm -hmm. But um, turned out that uh, we wanted to uh, check this at a more higher scale. Uh, so I think it was a good uh, brainstorming question. There are multiple ways that it could have gone. Um, but yeah, I think we ended up with um, a few good uh, starting points at least to tackle it. Yeah, I think so too. Um, in bits of feedback, I think like scaling out the approach too would be better. So like having a broadened horizon on the uh, the case maybe like, so not limit it to just like kind of phones and maybe think about um, other use cases with like uh, e-commerce as big as like Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think uh having like um i think more data points is also helpful when explaining these things so like being able to uh either like create assumptions uh, off of like uh how much like data we have to deal with mm -hmm. uh, and so uh one example of this is like uh being able to understand like if there are let's say like thousands of these duplicated products then um like how much can we automate out and just assume like an error case of like, you know, let's say like 5%. Um, mm -hmm. And then how much can we like do manually because it's like important. So like with iPhones, let's say like, it's pretty important, but let's say that we're selling like Pokemon cards that are like, you know, not that are duplicated. It's like, how much of that can we get on just like an automated solution of like doing, um, word matching and then mm -hmm. like getting a high enough threshold and then just being like, okay, that's fine. And then like running through the cases and getting like 3% error through manual yeah. selection right. and then getting like an idea that uh, if we scale that out, then we're okay with like 3% error uh, going forward. Yeah. Like right. So, so like a, um, a disclaimer or at least a dialogue around uh, what 
uh, thresholds could make sense uh, in terms of implementation that would have been helpful because yeah. i mean without really implementing um, i wouldn't really be able to tell you know what kind of error we would get on that but yeah. assuming we have enough data uh, we should just assume that we'll have an algorithm that does well and then we can talk about the uh, the sensitivity part of it yeah yeah exactly like uh, basically being able to tweak the sensitivity knob for like our business cases right like assuming that obviously we don't really care about duplication if it's a you know something that doesn't affect the business too much but mm -hmm. we do care if um you know multiple sellers uh are like trying to sell you know um really high value products like iPhones yep. or Macs for whatever reason, and we don't want it to like go past mm -hmm. like you know a first page results. Um, yeah, yeah but I think sense. your th general thought process on that was pretty good and structured, and like went down the narrow the path that like we're trying to lead towards. Um, mm. Cool. And then I guess uh, yeah, I guess lastly on that, like I guess is there any kind of um, ideas or thoughts you have around like potentially like how um these questions are almost measured in like real interviews um and this is kind of like apart from the mock interview but just like love your thoughts on like how you think um these questions like that are more ambiguous should get like kind of graded uh kind of like almost like rubric wise um okay like from a rubric wise i think uh, generally for case interviews what I think from a candidate perspective, they should be uh, graded based on what kind of questions they ask in the beginning, like what kind of clarifying questions they ask, uh, how much um, information other than the problem statement they're able to extract out of the interviewer because they asked the right questions and the interviewer actually wanted to give them some information so that uh, the discussion leads down to the path that they wanted to go to. Yeah. Because from what I understand, uh, more often than not in the case study interviews, um, it's the interviewer who decides what, uh, where the candidate needs to end up at. And even if the candidate has like multiple different ideas, um, it's up to the interviewer to guide him that this is the path I want you to take. So yeah, you know, I think the first step would be like checking how many uh, questions are they able to get in the beginning, uh, how many extra data points are they able to think. Um, and then maybe like five minutes of questioning and then based on all the answers they get, um, how are they able to like drill down on that on those data points like if do they have like a segmentation approach to estimating different values in that problem statement um, that should be pretty good and then um, of course um, uh, calling out the assumptions you know at every point uh, is the candidate calling out what assumptions he is making and then checking if those assumptions make sense or not with the business point of view um, so that um, seems to be a point that should be looked into um, and then, yeah, at the end, I think it's, there's never really a right answer. So it's just about you know, how well the candidate is able to summarize um, his solution to the problem. Okay, cool. No, I like that. I, uh, I enjoy that. I think that's a great way to kind of define it as well. Um, and especially yeah. since it's so ambiguous um, yeah. on either side, I think uh, being able to make note of what the good points are is helpful, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, awesome. Thanks so much for your help.